peace and hello in um, Arabic. And our mission is to encourage churches and individuals to um, welcome refugees and asylum seekers that live in our city. Mm -hmm. um, so this calling I, I um, received, I think, um, a couple of years ago when I met some Syrian friends, mm -hmm. um, and I realized that we had a lot of things in common, um, mm -hmm. my, our Syrian friends, my Syrian friends and I, um, even though we had grown up in very different parts of the world, I am from Ecuador originally, um, mm -hmm. we were from very different um, cultures, um, religion, mm -hmm. um, but we, we just had a lot of things in common and um, especially this thing that I like to call these uh, perpetual broken heartedness of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, enjoying the, the place mm -hmm. that you are. Mm -hmm. um, and Edinburgh is a wonderful place, uh, but also just missing so much uh, your family and your country. And mm -hmm. it's not just one big miss, one big broken heartedness. It's um, these little thousand little losses mm -hmm. that every day reminds you that you're not home. Um, like when you don't get a joke or you don't understand mm -hmm. somebody's accent or um, yeah, your kids don't like the food that you love. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I really resonate with the call in the Bible to welcome the stranger, the refugee, mm -hmm. the immigrant. Um, and I wanted to do something uh, to encourage our churches um, to fulfill that call. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's wonderful. And you know what I think of, because Christmas wasn't such a long time ago, it, the, you know, celebrating it, is the fact that Jesus himself was a refugee and had to flee. He and his family had to flee to Egypt for safety. So it just feels like such Christ-like work that you're involved in, welcoming the stranger and welcoming refugees. So so God bless you in that, Natalia. I, I even hear the passion in your voice as you as you speak about it. It's lovely. So, so you've you've shared that you're from Ecuador, and I'd love for you just to tell us a little bit more about your own story of just you know your, your upbringing and and how you've been you were formed by that Ecuadorian upbringing. Um, yes. Yeah, so I guess before I I tell you all about my a wee bit about my story, I want to say that um, I do acknowledge that um, like what what does a person that look like me so fair skin have anything to to say about racism? So um, I do want to get that out of the way and um, and also share that I actually have not experienced racism because. Um, even though I'm from Ecuador, and by the way, my parents are both 100% Ecuadorians. People ask me all the time if my parents are Ecuadorian. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I have not experienced racism. So I come from a place of a lot of privilege um, in mm -hmm. all of the places that I have lived. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to say that everything that I'm going to say is actually very nuanced and messy and complicated. So mm -hmm. it might stir up some um, things that like in your heart. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to unpack things. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I will give my email address at the end if anybody wants to continue this conversation. Um, so yeah, um, so I grew up in, in Ecuador. And Ecuador is a small country in um, South America. Uh, it's actually a wee bit bigger surface area wide surface area wise than the UK, but it has about a quarter of the population. Mm -hmm. And most people in Ecuador are mestizos, and I am a mestiza. So a mestiza means mestizos means that uh, we have both um, Spanish heritage and um, in indigenous heritage. Um, what that what that means um, practically, I guess, is that in in some families there's these wonderful rainbow of skin colors, um, and I am in one one end, and then some of my cousins are a lot darker skin than than I. Um, um, but that that meant that when I was little, I would always ask my parents like, why why do I look like the way that I do, and why do I look so different than my dear cousins or friends. Um, and then they had to explain to me the um, history of um, colonization. And it's mm. not a fun thing to mm. talk about with a five-year-old, seven-year-old, mm. um, um, because what happened is that in the 1500s, um, the Spanish um, con conquistadores, the conquerors, came to Ecuador and, um, yeah, in, in searching for fame and riches, um, mm. conquered the land, um, and enslaved people, rape women, um, stole uh, our, our natural resources, 
Um, and also, they, they, were, they remained in Ecuador for about thir- 300 years. Um, and during that time, uh, they established a caste system in which mm-hmm. they were, of course, at the top. <laughs> um, and people, um, you know, there were, there were different, um, I guess, levels. And at the very bottom were the indigenous people and the people from Africa that came mm-hmm. um, to, to South America as slaves. Mm-hmm. So even though we have been uh, not uh, a Spanish colony for about 200 years, that um, caste system, uh, even though it's not official, is still around. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would actually be considered, I guess, um, I don't know, I, want, I don't want to say like better, but in this system is, I have a lot of privilege um, in Ecuador just because the way that I look. Um, after finishing high school, I moved to the United States, uh, where again everybody was um, treat everybody treated me with a lot of kindness and respect. Um, and um, I also noticed that my uh, other Latino friends, my black friends, um, were not treated the same way than I was. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, they they would tell me all these experiences that I was not having mm-hmm. at all. Um, but in in 2016, uh, with the election of um, of Donald Trump, um, that's when things um, for me, I guess, in with when you were talking about the intersection of race and church, um, is when um, things got a bit um, different, difficult for me because um, I couldn't square how um, a lot of evangelicals would support somebody whose um, platform was very much uh, Mm anti-immigrant and especially anti-Latino. But Mm -hmm. anyway, again, that's a whole lot of uh, another conversation. Um, But yeah, but I did have a crisis of faith after the 2016 um, Mm -hmm. elections. Mm -hmm. A crisis of faith? Well, that sounds quite dramatic. Do do you want to... I mean, without going into anything political, are you able to just share a little bit about that? Um, it is. It is kind of a big. It's a big topic. Um, it was. Yeah. Well, I guess it was the main. The main thing was. So even some of my best friends, and my in-laws, some of my family, I have some family in the states. They were all um, supporting these anti-immigrant anti-refugee um, policies and they are all believers and I just mm-hmm. couldn't square how mm-hmm. you know the, the call in the Bible of mm-hmm. caring for each other like just at a very simple level <clears throat> and but then especially caring for those uh, most vulnerable which I think you know refugees um, immigrants are, mm-hmm. are very very vulnerable. <clears throat> So I just couldn't square that um, in my head. And I was, a lot of the people that I had been following um, as, you know, faith guides um, were supporting the policies that I disagreed with. Um, So yeah, it it is, it it could probably take the rest of the time. (laughs) But but yeah, I guess that's um, Mm -hmm. in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's really interesting. So you've had an experience of, of Ecuador and then you've been an adult in America and now you're living in Scotland. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what, what brought you to Scotland, actually. Um, so I came, <clears throat> excuse me, I came to Scotland in 2015. Um, and I came because my husband, um, who is a classic scholar, so he has this very, very specialized degree, um, couldn't find a job in the States, actually, um, but he found a lovely job that he loves at the University of Edinburgh. So we never thought we would end up here. We love it here. Um, but I do want to say that, it, you know, it wasn't like my dream to come to, to Scotland, even though I love it now. Um, and in a heartbeat, I would move back to Ecuador um, because it's a wonderful place and my family is there, obviously. Um, but yeah, so sometimes people assume that um, because I'm living here that I um, fled Ecuador, which is definitely not the case. I would, mm-hmm. um, I would move back. But yeah, mm-hmm. uh, so I love Scotland, and um, it's been an amazing part of my calling um, to be here. Mm-hmm. And your husband is he? Is he Ecuadorian, or is he Scottish, or is he American? Sorry, or what? Yeah. 
<laughs> he, he is um, American. His dad is Finland, Finnish, um, but okay. yeah, he, he grew up in the States. Right, okay. So you're also in a, a multicultural marriage then, and then raising your children in a third culture. So mm -hmm. very, very multicultural. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's wonderful. Sounds very, very rich. Yeah. So I know that you attended uh, one or more of uh, the Place at the Table conversations. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we did them with quite a spectrum of people. And so I, I'd love just, um, you know, with the time that we have left, probably 15-ish minutes, actually, but for you just to share a little bit, you know, because one of the things that we th we've talked about with the Place at the Table is we want to learn, but we also want to use what we've learned to, to, to be changed and to, and to act. We want to be responsive. In a, in a God honoring way to what we've learned. And so I just, I wondered if you could share some of your thoughts about the conversations you've heard and, and maybe offer some things as people are thinking here about the intersection between race and faith, and what, what you might offer us as we, as we think about, you know, about those issues. Um, so, yes, um, I have really, really enjoyed um, the place at the table conversations that I have attended or watched the, some of the recordings that we've had. Um, and I guess the first thing that I learned, um, I guess it wasn't super new, but it was very painful actually to hear, was um, the experiences of racism in Scotland. So sometimes um, we think that because there are not very many black folk or um, other ethnic minorities here um, in Scotland that um, there's no racism, which is absolutely not true. Um, so it was really, really painful to, to hear about their experiences. It was really painful to hear about their experiences in church. Um, so just, you know, people questioning their plays there or their even their presence there. Mm -hmm. uh, people walking down the street and being seen differently. Things that, you know, um, white people or white passing people like me uh, don't have to worry about. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to think about what we look like normally. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is all what, what privilege is. Mm -hmm. um, I was also reminded in, in the place of the school about um, our lack of collective imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I lived in the US, I was, um, I used to do HR, I used to do staff recruiting for um, uh, university. And um, I very quickly realized that my number one thing that I, that I needed to do to recruit a more diverse um, pool of staff, I guess, was to help people reimagine who could be, you know, the director of this department or the um, chancellor or the vice chancellor of, of the university, for instance. Um, just because what we imagine in our head has just such a big power on the way that we treat other people um, or the way that who we choose to be in power. Um, so I guess um, I want to invite everybody to think, you know, who, who do you think when you think pastor? Is it a white man? Mm -hmm. um, and for a long time, that was who I thought. Um, mm -hmm. even, even growing up in Ecuador, there's um, a big, uh, long legacy of um, missionaries, which is, they are wonderful. But, um, but yeah, this is, I guess, the, the first thing, the first thought that I would have in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, or, or this is a good one. Uh, what about a pilot? Who do you think an airplane pilot should be? Um, and I, I had a, a funny um instance once when there were two um women pilots the pilot and the co-pilot were women and i started praying more than i would normally pray and I, you know like i don't know what i was thinking like they were not going to lift their the plane with their hands or something like of course they could pilot the the plane and it was just fine but uh, we all have these um what are called unconscious biases Mm -hmm. um, of you know who who do you think should be in charge um, mm -hmm. even though we, when we don't really um, say it like that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah so um, I think it is that's why it's been so amazing to hear the stories of the people in in a place at the table because we do need to have um, more empathy um, and just yeah a broader imagination um, mm -hmm. so I guess I, I recommend um, reading fiction listening to other people um and yeah yeah listening listening and fostering empathy in, in everything that we do mm -hmm. um i also realized that 
a lot of people are grappling with these issues, um, which is wonderful. Um, so I wanted to show um, a framework that has been helpful to me as I am mm -hmm. doing ministry. Mm -hmm. Pamela, if, if that's okay, I'll... Absolutely, yeah. Can you share your screen with us? Yes, I'll show you. Um, so Pamela and I are, are fans of these gentlemen called Andy Crouch. Um, and I, yeah, I hope that I, I give justice to, to this framework. But this framework is um, from a book called Strong and Weak by Andy Crouch. And um, he talks about um, authority and vulnerability, which are part of our human experience. Um, so these, these, thing, these things are seemingly opposite, but they're not actually. And I hope that you'll see how these complement um, each other. So Andy Crouch defines authority or power as the agency to act, the capacity to exert meaningful action and to make a difference. So this is power as it, at its best, um, the things that you can do to, to make a difference. Um, and then vulnerability, he says that it is the taking or the having of a meaningful risk, the chance of losing something of value. So this is more than you know um, emotional openness, but it is um, either taking a risk or having a risk. Um, so so he has these um, graphed with four quadrants, and um, so I'll explain that we're all somewhere in this continuum of, of authority and vulnerability, and this will hopefully, just bear with me, this will all make sense, and it is relevant to our conversation on race. Um, so to the left and up is increasing, so to, to sorry, to the right um, and up is increasing, so vulnerability increases to the right authority increases upwards and to the left and down is decreasing um, so in this quadrant of suffering um, the people that are here are um, high in vulnerability so they have loads of things um, to lose and low in power um, and i can guarantee i know now that 100 percent of us have been in this in this quadrant because we have all experienced the pandemic. So we were very vulnerable, we are very vulnerable, some of us less now with, with the vaccine. And there was actually not that much more, not that much that we could do. Um, and um, poverty is in this quadrant, so poverty is more than just a lack of material possessions, although that is part of it, but it is the um, inability to do some anything or very much about getting out of your circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure that we've, we've experienced these. So, sorry. So the next one is actually the opposite of that. Um, and it is exploiting or control. And that's when, when people have a lot of authority and low vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And at first that sounds amazing, <laughs> you know, like, Mm -hmm. Having being able to do a lot of things but not risking too much, mm -hmm. um, but it's actually a very dehumanizing choice. Um, mm -hmm. So and the the price that people pay of having a lot of authority with low vulnerability is um, that somebody will su suffer. So mm -hmm. somebody will be moved to the quadrant mm -hmm. number two of suffering um, when people are exploiting when they get a lot of authority mm -hmm. without. Um, vulnerability. So some examples here are um, the Spanish Empire getting a lot of richness, um, a lot of power, and then who suffered were indigenous uh, people and black slaves. Um, the British Empire, actually, I just was reading about the, um, the division between India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. and how families had to move uh, because they, they, mm -hmm. the British Empire decided that um, Hindus and Sikhs were going to live in India and Muslims in um, Pakistan. So people had to uproot mm -hmm. their entire, entire lives because the British Empire wanted to um, avoid um, religion com religious conflict. Um, I guess also closer to, to our time, I think 
um, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, is a good good example of these exploiting because um, he is you know astronomically rich, uh, whereas his employees in Amazon don't even get um, toilet breaks. Yeah. Um, moving moving on, the, um, so the the next. Um, quadrant is the withdrawing quadrant, and this is uh, when people have low authority and um, low um, vulnerability. So they're not willing to take risks or exercise much authority. So I, I find this is the trickiest to understand, but I guess think about the uh, a stereoty- stereotypical gamer that lives in their parents' basement. Um, yeah. So. Apologies if there are any gamers out there, but I guess this is what I'm, I'm thinking of. So people that are choosing not to exercise their authority or the vulnerability. Um, and I guess uh, just a very quick word of caution um, here. So I have heard in Scotland a wee bit of um, a narrative that the church is being persecuted here. And um, I, I just want to put this as an option there that um, Especially when we compare the how in other parts of the world the church is being really persecuted, and how um, our Muslim friends, our um, Hindu friends, our Sikh friends are treated here in the UK, um, I'm not really sure if that's completely mm-hmm. completely true. And um, so I think that sometimes uh, some churches get are are in this place of feeling like they're very vulnerable um, and not taking risk or exercise authority. Yes. Um, and then finally, the flourishing um, quadrant, which is, you know, having loads of authority or, um, yeah, good, this good power to make a difference by taking risks. Mm-hmm. And I just heard on the BBC the other day, a wonderful story of this painter in California that um, would paint uh, pictures of people experiencing homelessness, um, portraits, and then he would sell them, um, and all the procedures would get to to the subject of the portrait. So he has lots of authority um, because the pictures are beautiful. Um, they they sell for thousands of dollars, um, and but he also takes the risk of approaching somebody and you know saying, "Do you want a portrait?" Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, um, and then um, another person that I think we all are here to emulate mm-hmm. is our our savior Jesus. So again, mm-hmm. high authority, he is the savior of the world. Um, high vulnerability came mm-hmm. to the world as a baby. Um, high authority, he spoke with authority. That's what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. He spoke with authority. He um, recognized what was inside people's hearts. High vulnerability, um, he died uh, for mm-hmm. us. I have learned that he rose again. Anyway, so this um, goes on and on and on. Um, so yeah, so this is who we um, hope to to emulate. Um, so in, at this point, to make it just a wee bit interactive, if people have any ideas of things that are high in authority, high in vulnerability, just to, I guess, spark people's imaginations, um, yeah, I would love love for you all to maybe pop in the chat. Uh, but in the meantime, I will um, just tell you a, a wee bit more about this. So as a person of privilege, because I am a white passing person, um, I think of all the time, something that I think of all the time is how do I use my privilege, my authority to help others that don't? Um, so. One, one thing that I do all the time, you know, as I'm um, in ministry is how do I help people that are in this quadrant, in this suffering quadrant, to come mm-hmm. up to um, the flourishing quadrant? Mm-hmm. And some of that, uh, for instance, I, I think one thing that just immediately pops in my mind is English teaching. Um, because, you know, if you don't speak the language, um, as a lot of our refugee friends uh, when they first arrived to the country, it's really tough. Like, how do you mm-hmm. communicate with your doctor or mm-hmm. with your children's teacher and everything, your neighbors? Um, so by, you know, helping somebody practice their um, language skills, you are giving them such a gift. Um, and again, 
just given them more authority. Mm. Um, so for uh, a lot of us, for a lot of churches, I think, they have more power, more authority than they realize. Because yeah. um, they have, maybe some of them have a building, have volunteers, even money. How can they um, take the risk? How can they move from, from these quadrant of maybe not, not taking too many risks mm-hmm. to uh, flourishing? Um, so in that, you know, some, sometimes um, some people have asked me, like, what do I do now with all of this information about um, unconscious bias and racism and things like that? Um, so maybe maybe for them, the, the calling is um, maybe start some conversations, maybe even some risky conversations, maybe, um, you know, defend somebody if, mm. um, if they're being mistreated. Mm. Um, yeah. Anyway, there's there's loads that we can do um, to just take risks, to become more like Jesus, to help others um, increase in their power um, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if they're in that third quadrant of withdrawing, how can you increase in both authority and vulnerability? And for some people, you know, it would be getting a degree, studying something that they can use to, to put to the world and uh, bless others. Mm-hmm. Um, or practicing a skill, things like that. Mm-hmm. These are all things that will help you increase in authority and then taking mm-hmm. risks, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, finally, we're all in this journey of, of becoming um, more like Jesus mm-hmm. um, and using our authority, um, taking risks. Um, and when we do these, the, the amazing thing about these, it's, I feel like it's almost magical <laughs> that when we do these, others join us as well and others get in, inspired. And yeah, there's just um, so, so much beauty and power in, in all of these. Um, um, so yeah. And then uh, I just want to like leave you with, with a final quote from the poet Maya Angelou. Um, do your best until you know better, then when you know better, do better. Um, And sorry, and then just my my email address again, I I don't think we have time for questions. But um, yeah, if you if anything didn't sit right with you, or if you have any questions, I would really love um, to continue this conversation. Um, and I hope that we can make a place at the table open to to everybody because there's just so much um, richness in um, learning from one another and listening to our stories. Wow, thank you so much, Natalia. That was that was really, really rich. And I think um, you've given some really some really wonderful examples and suggestions there of how we can all increase vulnerability and increase uh, authority. Um, and I think what was what was lovely about what you said toward the end is that then we see these amazing things happen, you know, and it really, I think it takes a village, right? I mean, the very common <laughs> problem in an African context, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think it, it takes all of us helping one another, because I think even the starting point in this grid is actually identifying where we are, which quadrant we are in, whether it's individually or, or within our church context, and then and then maybe talking with one another um, about how do we then move each other and how do we then move into a more, you know, into this space where we're more like Jesus and we're flourishing. So thank you. That was, that was really, uh, really, really well done. Um, so I just want to remind you the book that, that she referenced is Andy Crouch. It's called Strong and Weak. Um, I have not actually read that particular book of his, but I can definitely recommend him um, as a prophetic voice for us. <laughs> Um, and then just to say that a place at the table, we will be continuing these, these conversations every two months. So we don't have the date for the next one actually set yet, um, but it will be, it will be coming up in, in another couple of months. So uh, stay tuned and you'll probably be hearing from the team at Edinburgh City Mission um, and be invited to join us on Zoom for one of those. So, and, and, in, and in the regular place at the table, there will be a chance to have a, a real Q&A online with one another. So thank you again, Natalia. Thank you. Thank you so much for leading um, all the places at the table with such grace and openness, curiosity. Thank you. Really good. All right. I'll turn it back over to the hosts. 
Thank you, Pamela. Um, just a quick note, we do have a date for a place at the table, our guest confirmed just this week. Um, it's going to be on the 23rd of April. Um, and it will be a pastor uh, from an Indian heritage, so uh, we'll, be looking at, we'll be sending out the information. I'm going to put uh, Natalia's email and my email on the chat in case you didn't have a chance to um, copy hers. And if you have a questions about a place at the table, you would like to get the link to participate, just drop me an email.